a lot of spoke shapes don't have some other profile for flat, and, and so then it becomes less important. So, you know, if you were trying to shape a chair bottom, you don't care about flatness, you want a bit of a curve, you want a, you know, like a very aggressive jack plane iron shape uh, to the blade. But uh, th these are more forgiving than, than the plane, just to, due to the way that they get used. Um, there's a huge throat there, so you're not you're not as concerned with the spoke shape and preventing tear out and breaking the wood as you are generally with the plane. The, the spoke shape, because of the, the depth of the throat, is not going to firmly hold the wood down and prevent it from tearing and breaking the way that a plane item does. Uh, so this is you can see the throat of the plane here is a lot smaller than, uh, than the throat. Of the on the spoke shape. And that's because the, the blade was holding the wood down, preventing it from, from chipping and breaking. And in fact, a lot of the blades have an adjustable throat. Yes. This is an example. So you can actually, you want to have the tightest throat that you can get without clogging the, the blade iron, without hitting the blade iron with the throat. So you, you might, depending on the thickness of the shaving that you're taking out, you might need to adjust that throat slightly. This, this pivots back and forth and moves the in and out and closes the throat opening. With a traditional bench plane, you can actually affect the throat opening by um, you need to remove the plane iron to make it a little less convenient. And you need a screwdriver. So you can loosen these two screws here and the whole frog will slide back and forth. You have a you don't have a huge amount of flexibility because this part of the sole, you, know, you can't go back too far. And as you go too far forward, you then have more unsupported plane iron. So actually when I look at this, the frog is not perfectly aligned in here. On this side, the frog is just proud of the sole, and on this side, it's just behind the sole. So you have to loosen those two screws and, and twist it around a little bit, mm -hmm. rather than plane the whole thing. Are those screws in slots? These two screws, yep, have a little, there's a little bit of... Not really a slot, but the hole is a little, ever so slightly sloppy. So you can, you can pivot and then move back and forth. It, it's a very small one on this, but it's, it's there. So if you want to get a better uh, finish with a spoke shape, do you just need a different spoke shape that will give you what you want? You can't really adjust it much? Um, the way to adjust the spoke shape is just the depth of cut. Whereas with a plane, you have depth of cut and you have the lateral alignment of the plane iron and you have the throat depth. So the, the fact that the front of the plane is pushing and holding the wood down prevents it from tearing out. You don't really have that with the spoke shape as much. But are there special purpose spoke shapes that will provide that for you if you need it? Stupid cutter blades, what you're asking, yeah. I guess, or. Like a convex or a contour. Yeah, you can get different shapes. Well, I was, I was thinking about trying to cut, uh, I don't know, Elm is the one that, that I keep hearing about. It's mm -hmm. impossible without tearing up. Yes. Um, I don't use this book yet, but it's, it's one of those things that seems like it would be really good to be able to use, but if it's going to leave a bad surface, then I don't know, you end up sanding it instead? Yep. I mean, it's a, it's a rough shaping tool, really, mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's often used in chair making, the, the convex mm -hmm. shaped. It's not, it's not really intended to make a flat surface. No, but I thought that if you scooped out a chair with one, that that was the finished surface. I didn't realize that you would have to do heavy sanding afterward. Um, again, the best way to avoid sanding is to have your tool as sharp as possible. That's really, the, that's, with it, especially with spoke shape, that is what will eliminate the need for sanding or any other sort of smoothing works. You, know, you could also use a scraper to help help with, uh, with that in the end. But as with most other, you know, woodworking operations, the sharpness of the tool is really what will determine how well it works.
This would be, again, in the timber frame, we would use this for trimming the end grain. So if we make a cut that's a little bit out of square, or we're trying, we have a, a piece of end grain that is exposed, like the ends of these tenons. You might use a little block blade like this. This would also be very handy for um, trimming shingles to, to nail them up, or if you're weaving yeah. the corners to put a slight taper on the, on the edge of the, of the shingle where they, where they you know, overlap each other. Generally, you know, this is the type of tool that a, that a carpenter would carry in his tool belt and use for many different miscellaneous things, all the way down to sharpening the pencil. Yeah. It's literally Trust it down. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you, you just you don't see that anymore today. You might see a carpenter, a modern-day carpenter, with a, with a random dusty plane sitting on its side in the toolbox between the cordless drill and the nail gun and all that stuff, but you can tell by the rust on the plane iron that it hasn't seen any action for years. You mean for Schindler? Um, yeah, you know, a lot of carpenters nowadays use a, uh, use a router. So they'll, they'll nail the shingle up uh, and, and have and not do any pre-trigger or anything like that. They'll just nail the shingle up and they'll use the, the shingle on the back side as a guide and they'll use a bush, you know, they use a router with a bushing on the bit and just zzz, walk right down and get perfect results. Vice to invent to do that would become popular. That's the, uh, the general trend. I think my reluctance to use the planes because I haven't set them up properly and so no question. It, it'll work well. work well. Yes. And, and I have a small shop and I'm working on small projects and Using these would really be yeah. great. Yeah, and it's amazing what a good yeah. plane does. But just as good as a good plane performs, a well tuned plane performs, uh, and the same passion that it evokes in you will be mirrored by the frustration of a poorly tuned plane that you, know, you can't get to move through the water. It breaks the water as you try to play it. Yes, I would recommend not even bothering to try to use a blade until you've got it. I had another question. I get confused about how much of the blade the iron should be exposed mm -hmm. through the throw. Is there? I'm sure that there are general rules of thumb, but I always go by feel. And, and not, I mean, not exclusively feel, but largely feel, because if it's, if it's too much, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter what you're doing, it's going to make a mess. Um, I always like to start with, with the tiniest little bit, and then I'll plane like up, up here. If you want to come take a look at this, but this is I was I was using this this plane, and you can see where I was just kissing the tops of the. You, know, you see the slight different color here. That's nice. That's kind of cool. It feels so good as you're as you're slicing. It's a little slow, but that's the way I like to start. You know, it's moving easily through the wood because of the grain and the softness of the wood and so on, and then I'll adjust it up a little bit more. Um, or if I'm just trying to quickly thin something out because it's too thick, then I'll go with a much more aggressive cut. Uh, generally, I'll, I'll make that adjustment based on feel and what it is I'm trying to do. When you're playing across the, the end grain, um, again, I like to have a very small 